RealAgriculture.com presents Farming Forward. Sharpen your soil health expertise with cover cropping, nitrogen management, and advanced grazing. Brought to you by the Farm Resilience Mentorship Program. I'm Kelvin Hepner. In this episode, we're standing in a canola research trial looking at nitrous oxide emissions, talking about the future of nitrogen application and nitrogen management. Dr. Mario Tenuta is the Industrial Senior Research Chair for 4R Nutrient Stewardship at the University of Manitoba. We're talking about the future of nitrogen management. All right, joined now by Mario Tenuta of the University of Manitoba. And Mario, talking about nitrogen management into the future, what do you see as trends or, or things that we should anticipate on the horizon when it comes to how we apply and, and manage nitrogen and, of course, crop uptake, making it available to the crop, but also with the, the mindset uh, focused around emissions and reducing emissions as well? Right. So, really, we can see it right now happening. We have... Um a greater emphasis on digital tools, precision tools that um, are going to be likely increasingly available to farmers and that are going to be actually increasingly um, more beneficial to farmers. So one aspect is particularly related with the rate of nitrogen. How do we set our rates? So I see um, us moving beyond a single soil test sample and then um, um, using our cost of fertilizer and our, our anticipated uh, commodity price to figure out uh, our application rates to where we're going to be for some crops that are longer in the duration of nitrogen uptake saying let's split the application of nitrogen now obviously in arid semi-arid areas that's going to be could be potentially risky but in areas that such as the eastern prairies Manitoba um, can uh, work, so we can see that in, in corn, uh, we, we've done it in canola as well, and that gives farmers flexibility to change their rates depending on how the year is going, and that's great. Rather than commit all your nitrogen and your investment in one shot, you can make um, a partial investment and then you can make a decision based on how the season is going how much more nitrogen. And related with that then is to sense the crop in terms of using tools uh, such as uh, green, seek green Seeker, Crop Circle. Um, um, so these like, you know, using drones and things to get spectral uh, canopy reflectance. And then also satellites. Probably satellites is the way we're gonna be going. That way you don't need to fly a drone. You can just um, sign up for a service and you pick, get the pictures that you want. And I, so I think I see that happening and then I see us really moving to uh, a precision where it's not only going to be variable rate nitrogen applications. So we put the investment in the nitrogen dollars where we get the most return for it, right? And, and, but uh, so, so areas that we don't get the return, we lay off on the nitrogen. In some areas, we may say we just lay off cropping, period, in some depression areas and things. But I also see on top of that, um, later in, and what I'm referring to as pre precision for our nitrogen management. Then that means varying the nitrogen rate, especially in our uh, hummocky landscapes, and varying the rate of nitrogen, but also the type of nitrogen. So put enhanced efficiency fertilizers as controlled release products or inhibited products, inhibitor products, where they're prone to being lost. So I, I really see that layering that with our yield maps, our um, grid or management zone uh, soil um, sampling. And um, I, I really see that's where we're going to be seeing lots of opportunity and, and, good, and good, good return. So I see it's that sophistication. Yeah. We're standing in a research plot here where you're measuring emissions, nitro yeah. nitrogen emissions, N2O emissions specifically. Uh, this is some of these practices you've done a fair bit of research on in terms of trying to understand the potential in terms of uh, the nitrous oxide reduction from that environmental perspective. 
Oh yes, yeah. So here, for example, where we're looking at where we're putting the fertilizer in terms of the depth of band placement, and then using the nitrification inhibitor as well to reduce uh, nitrous oxide emissions. So, um, big effective placement. You know, the deeper the band placement, the better for uh, reducing N2O emissions. The nitrification inhibitor is very effective in reducing uh, N2O emissions. We've others. We've seen other practices as well in terms of. Um, in areas such as uh, the top of knolls, having low emissions of uh, nitrous oxide generally, um, and in depression areas as well, very wet would have low emissions, but the areas that are moist, as we go mid-slope and so forth, can have more, more emissions. And in some areas in a variable landscape where the knolls are so eroded or low um, uh, a horizon with, with organic matter that um, there can be low yields so we don't necessarily see an increase in N2O at the knolls compared to mid slope but we get less yield so therefore we're producing more emissions uh, per less unit of um, of yield so there's there's lots of out there you know the four R's uh, source rate uh, timing placement there are all factors in there and um, you know you can pick them you have many we have many options in each of those four r's and we can use them in combination and so that's 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 what we hope to get out to give uh, options to growers to mix and match the the practices that reduce emissions that suit in that particular year that field and that cropping and that condition weather conditions um to come up with that suite of practices that makes most sense yeah what's your response if i put my farmer hat on i I say fertilizer is expensive, nitrogen is expensive. I'm, I'm already trying to be as efficient as I can with it. What do you think drives that next? You referred to precision for R. What do you think drives that next tier of change in practices or, or products that are used? Because all of these things have some cost attached to them as well. Yeah, the cost is a big factor, and we need to know those costs. You need to know those costs because then you want to make sure that you recover those costs, and that's a key thing. Uh, so. It comes down to economics. It's it's always going to be our driver. We want it to be the driver, actually, because if we if we don't have to pay attention to economics, then we're going to be doing things on farm that make no sense. And so we we gotta, you know, if we're talking about environmental benefit, it needs to be in an environmental context. So there needs to be a value to that environmental benefit. If it's reducing greenhouse gases, what's the business case for that? Is it a carbon trading market is it using nitrogen more efficiently so that maybe we can adjust our nitrogen rates and therefore save some nitrogen costs for for rate but then we're using a, a fancy efficiency fertilizer product that costs more so we're not changing our net balance or input costs um, but we're using less nitrogen producing less greenhouse gases um, maybe that's using um, cost sharing programs like the off calf programs that we currently have uh, in Manitoba and other provinces in Canada so you know we, we keep saying know the cost and make sure we um, pay for those costs and then actually in some cases I think we can by increasing our efficiency reducing our losses we can make more profitability that's that's what I think uh, we should be striving for a lot of the practices, just as a final question here, Mario, a lot of the practices you've referenced are already ones that have been tested and researched, and we know they, they, they're they effective in terms of reducing emissions. Maybe the economics haven't clearly played out yet on the at the farm level. But what about maybe more futuristic ideas? We have, we're have we starting to see more products on the market uh, aimed at uh, increasing nitrogen fixation or enabling plants, helping them with nitrogen fixation in the field. Uh, there's nanotechnology, there's all different types of frontiers on the on the fertilizer and crop nutrition front anything there that stands out to you in, in terms of having potential or something that you're excited about yeah quite a few things actually um well one of them is on the the nitrogen fixers and we're seeing uh, those on the market now i think uh, they the products are going to be better in the future um with more selection and and more research and investment by the big companies in that area that's one thing i also see in terms of the the crop uh, genetics. So we're going to have a whole new series of crop genetics come available to us in the next few years with CRISPR technology and and um, uh, 
uh, not really, well, it's genetic modification, but not in the sense like ins inserting genes or anything like that. It's actually just uh, turning things on and off and doing things like that with the, with the genes already present in crops and so forth. And so I see um, there's going to be lots, you're going to start seeing drought tolerant, more nitrogen uh, efficient uh, crops based on, on these technologies coming out. So I'm really excited about that. And I think we're going to see uh, innovations in the nitrogen fertilizer space. Like you mentioned nanotechnology. Um, at some point there's going to be start being breakthroughs where we're going to be able to um, produce nitrogen fertilizers that are going to release their nitrogen uh, on cue from the crop. Insane. Um, I'm limited by nitrogen uh, and then the fertilizer granule will, will deliver it. And so I, I see that. So in other words, right now we add our nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, yeah, we can control it for a couple of weeks with some with inhibitors and control the release, but we can't do it much longer than that. But I think we're going to have products that are going to be um, uh, stable for months. And it's not until roots are present that um, need nitrogen that they're going to deliver. So I, I can't, I can't wait for that. And of course, there's the Holy Grail, which is like having canola and spring wheat uh, with nodules on it. Uh, very complex to uh, be able to do that. However, um, it, it, it someday will happen. All right. Lots to think about. It's fascinating. Thank you, Mario. Thanks, Kelvin. If you enjoyed this video and want to continue to sharpen your soil health expertise, encourage you to go to farmlearninghub.ca to learn more.